Here we go. Dr. Jacqueline Chassie, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So happy to be here. Likewise. Um, so let's get started. Let's just dive right in. And I absolutely love your story. You are an enigma to me because you are not just a one-sided doctor or naturopath or a physician or just on the policy side. You mix everything together. And I think that's absolutely wonderful. Can you tell us your story in your own words? Sure. Well, thank you so much. Um, so my background actually was biochemistry and lab research. And um, I did my undergraduate degree and kind of looked at what I wanted to do afterward. Uh, I worked for a couple of years in a lab that studied preclinical um, drugs. So it was a diagnostic drug that was used in MRI contrast agents. And um, that was super interesting. I got a lot of exposure. I did a lot of physics, which was a new expansion of my knowledge base. And then decided about, you know, from what I wanted to do for grad school, I was looking at PhD programs that were more research oriented or going into medicine, which I'd always been interested in. And I never had heard of naturopathic medicine before. I had actually applied to conventional schools and was accepted at Dartmouth and had intended to start there. And it kind of cropped up somewhere in that year of application that I learned about naturopathic school. And when I learned about it, it just felt like such an incredible fit for me. You know, I was one of those people that I've never liked even taking a Tylenol for pain. I was resistant and I wanted to know what else could I do? Could I drink more water? Could I get more sleep? You know, what was it that was triggering? And that comes a little bit from my health background as well. Um, but it was just such a great fit. And I fell right into that naturopathic medicine role. I was lit up writing my essays for school and I just knew that that was a better fit for me. And, and that was probably actually a big coming of age for me because, you know, I remember my dad is an accountant. He said to me, okay, so you've got an opportunity to pursue a PhD for free where they would pay you while you're a student, or you could go to medical school at an Ivy League school, or you could do this thing that no one has ever heard of graduate $100,000 plus in debt, and then try to claw your own way. And I was like, pretty much. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, but I'm so, so glad I took that path because I feel so passionate about naturopathic medicine and integrative medicine. And, and you know, in my time in practice, which is coming on 15 years now, hard to believe, I've seen people's lives transform. And, you know, it's not me, it's them. But to be able to stand alongside them and guide them through that process of really seeing what it takes to find health um, and doing that for themselves. It's, you know, I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Yeah. And I, and so for those folks who don't know the difference between naturopathic versus a regular Western medicine, what is the difference? That's an awesome question. So a naturopathic medical school is still a four year school. Um, it's approved by the department of education. It's accredited you know, by the U S department of education. But the education, the first two years is really pretty much identical, but the last two years are really different. So a naturopathic degree really just focuses on what we would call primary care medicine or like outpatient medicine. So I never did really surgical rotations other than minor surgery, like, you know, stitches and skin tag removal and stuff like that. Um, and instead of doing hospital rotations, we spend that time learning a lot more modalities. So we get more than a master's level in counseling. We get more than a master's level in nutrition. Um, we do physical medicine like a chiropractor or osteopath would do. We do herbal medicine and homeopathy is the fifth area. So you get this very wide spectrum of all these other therapeutics on top of drugs, which we do learn and we can prescribe, uh, but it gives you such a big toolkit when it comes to working with patients and you can really help people find the best short and long-term plan for them. And I think you've also been quite uh, fundamental to getting naturopaths covered under insurance, correct? Yeah. Like I said, I'm really passionate about what we do and about patient access. And that's one big challenge for naturopathic doctors and for patients who want this kind of medicine is that depending upon where you are, NDs can't do everything in all states because the licenses are different. Mm -hmm. And some states even don't offer licenses right now. And oftentimes it's not covered by health insurance. Even if it's the same thing like pap smear that they might be getting from a medical doctor. So, yeah, on my state level, which my license is in New Hampshire, uh, we worked to get insurance coverage and passed, and that happened quite a long time ago. And um, I'm sure insurance companies are saving a lot of money now from that. 
Um, and then I've also been really involved on the national level um, with our national association in leadership there to help other states do the same thing. And your history seeing clients and patients for the past 15 years, as well as on the policy side, what have you seen as, as changing or has, has changed in the past X years in women's health? Yeah, I mean, one, I don't know if you've found this, but I think awareness of integrative medicine is at an all-time high, and compared to 10 years ago, it's a completely different world. Do you feel that way, too? A hundred percent. I find, especially with my my family history, we went from Western medicine as the only way, and now all the way to homeopathy. So we've completely switched, and we've had cancer in my family, we've had heart disease, we've had a whole host of different things. And, and now it's seen as less woo-woo and it's seen as, wait, this might actually be a, an interesting holistic approach to health. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the woo, like the woo-woo theories that naturopathic doctors and holistic providers put out there are now, the science is kind of catching up with clinical observation. Like you, one great example is leaky gut syndrome, which was a very like consumer facing term that was a highly criticized thing. Well, now we have, you know, thousands of papers on intestinal permeability um, and the understanding of the fact that when the gut lining is damaged, it leaves you more susceptible to illnesses, wide variety of illnesses. Um, So the science is caught up there or the importance of probiotics or mold toxicity. I mean, you could list, you know, adrenal function even, you know, there's more and more data backing up some of those observations. That's probably one of the biggest changes. And I think the consumer interest being at a halt all time high makes a lot of sense because drugs are, they're not effective. Sometimes they're getting more and more expensive. People don't feel good when they're on them. And I think the boomer generation, like our parents' generation, it's a little bit different than their parents where doctors were gods and you just did what they said. And it was disrespectful to think that maybe you had some other, you know, idea that should be considered. And I think finally, like probably thanks to us, our parents are speaking up a little bit more about their health and we're seeing that too. You know, so I think that's the other really big difference. Um, That's not women's health specific, but across healthcare in general, really. Yeah. I think I've, I've also seen at least perhaps in myself and my, my peers, it's, we see how many pills, how many drugs our family has to be on, our parents have to be on. And yet there doesn't seem to be much of a change in health. It's just a, a watering down of the symptoms or it's a band-aid approach and i think now i mean i'm in my 30s it's saying well wait can i do something today to prevent having to be on pills when i'm 50 60. Mm -hmm. yeah and thank goodness for that you know women's health hasn't changed it's not the most like in my opinion innovative arm of medicine right now from a clinical perspective there's a lot of things there's some new procedures and techniques we can chat about that from a fertility perspective And in fertility specifically, there's um, kind of a wave of clinicians who are now encouraging younger women to be more proactive about their fertility and do things like egg freezing when they're in their 20s, if they know they don't want to have children right away. But from my perspective, that's not necessarily the story we should be telling people. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a chance to get into that. But still, in women's health, one of the reasons why I love doing that from an integrative perspective are there are so many more things that we can do. And if you go to your OBGYN for most things, most of the time the the result will be a recommendation of a birth control pill. I love that you're saying that. So that's that's a really good segue in terms of talking about the topic we'll be speaking at for this is infertility and your primary focus, I I think, within your practice and um and yeah, kind of what what you specialize in. So just can you start us off with the basics of infertility? What what is it? What are what needs to happen in order for somebody to get pregnant? Because I think a lot of people, myself included, have always thought, oh, this is really easy. This this is just gonna happen and that's it. And I and I find the more that I look into it, the more that I'm speaking with my girlfriends, it's not really all that easy. So can you walk us through that? Yeah. I mean, we spend like decades of our life protecting working to not get pregnant (laughs) that's the irony of it is that we spend so much time and energy thinking about how we won't get pregnant how we can like not get pregnant when we're younger and then when you get older you realize it's a lot more difficult than you thought it was um you know i think one thing 
is that you can only get pregnant on about five days of your cycle. Uh, and I know like, especially for younger women, that's a huge shock because they think their fertility window is so much broader, but it's really not. Um, it's very, very narrow. Um, and there's a lot you can do to understand your body and know when those five days are happening. But when you ask the question, like what needs to happen to, for, to have good fertility or to get pregnant, the more you learn about it, like the more amazing it is to me that anyone ever has babies because it is so complex. And I'm not kidding when I say thousands of steps have to go perfectly right in order to have a baby carried to term. I mean, it really is that way. And it's a beautiful process and it's a lot of it is not understood yet. And I actually like that mystery. Um, I'm excited that there's research to keep figuring it, trying to figure it out, but you know, it really is amazing. You know, I'm not a highly religious person, but when you think about the organization involved from cellular systems to be able to, you know, produce another human, it's this way for every, every animal, it does make you think, you know, wow, there, there is something very elegant happening here that is amazing. You know, it's really very amazing. So, you know, starting at the beginning, you've got to have healthy egg and healthy sperm. And so there's the process of making those, um, which for a woman, our eggs in our ovaries were developed when we were in our mother's womb. My mom carried her grandchildren is another way to think about it. You know, my children were actually in my mother's womb at one point in time. Um, so there's this generational aspect for women that we carry on for our children and not so much for men, um, but they're constantly producing millions and millions of sperm. Um, so those cells have to be really good quality. They have to fertilize, which is when the sperm DNA comes inside of the egg. And then the DNA has to replicate properly. And then it forms what's called a blastocyst. And that kind of swims through the fallopian tube and gets into the uterus. And we can spend more time talking about the uterus, but to get implantation to happen, it's not like Velcro. You know, it's not like throwing a tennis ball at a Velcro wall. There are a lot of chemical signals that have to happen and a lot of immune changes that have to happen so that mom doesn't recognize that blastocyst, it's half dad's tissue as foreign and doesn't get rid of it, right? And then, you, then that's only the very beginning. Once implantation starts, then you have everything that has to happen to go from you know, a single cell to a human being. It's, it's really pretty amazing. What I saw in one of your other talks was that it's 30 to 40 percent of, of, of fertility uh, or infertility, right? 30 to 40 percent is women oriented, 30 to 40 percent is, is the man, and then 20 to 30 percent is a combination of the two and whether they're, they, they have issues on, on either side. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, women really, and this is in data and also in my own practice, Women carry the burden of infertility for the couple generally, but it's equally, you know, biologically a man's issue and a woman's issue. Um, so it is a really interesting perspective there. And I don't know if people realize, but the rates of infertility are one in eight or about 15% in the U.S. And that's the same disease rate as breast cancer. You know, just to give you that perspective, like we talk a lot about breast cancer and women are hugely supported through breast cancer, but infertility is a little bit different because it still has, and, and we've done a lot in the last, I would say two to three years to really lift the veil of shame around infertility so that couples don't have to suffer and carry that in silence. It's not your body failing you, you know, any more than any other health condition. Uh, but the, it, the prevalence rate is very high. Chances are that each of us know a handful of people who are struggling right now that have not told us. Yeah. Is that number one in eight? Is that specifically for the U.S.? Is that, or is that for similar across other modern societies as well? Yeah, it is U.S. data, but it is very similar in other Western countries, Britain, Australia. You know, they all really follow those same numbers, unfortunately. And I like that you brought up the idea of shame and how much people aren't speaking about this and how that I have found that people are starting to speak up more, more often, but yet there is such a, a burden that the woman or the man will don't want to talk about it because it's seen as I've done something wrong or I'm fill in the blank inept or whatever, whatever the, the negative term one can bring up. I don't eat well enough. I weigh too much. I weigh too little. I work out too much, you know, People carry, you know, I, I took a birth control pill in my past. 
I had a sexually transmitted illness in my past. I, you know, had an abnormal pap smear, like all of those things that we question, is that the factor? And ultimately, there's a lot of drops in the bucket that lead to infertility and we can't control all of them. So in terms of what kind of the the difference or how how you take a look at infertility versus a more Western approach. Can you talk us through that a little bit and what how important it is? I know that you talk a lot about uh, foundational preconception care and, and how that ties in for you. Yeah, so the difference between a conventional approach and a naturopathic approach, you know, at first the diagnostic um, steps are kind of similar, but with naturopathic medicine, we're always looking for what we call the root cause diving deeper and deeper to figure out, well, why is that happening? You know, if your hormones are out of balance, why are they out of balance? If your egg quality or sperm quality isn't optimal, why isn't it? You know, and so sometimes it can be genetics or it can be in some kind of underlying disorder, or it might be a toxin exposure or, you know, nutrition or something that you have control over. Maybe you're doing night shifts and your sleep is off. Um, We're always looking to kind of dig deeper and ask, well, why? Well, why? Well, why? Until we really get to the bottom and can unravel what's happening. It ultimately is that infertility is not just a, a on-off switch. It's a systemic, holistic condition in which your body feels like it's not able to or not safe enough to have a child. Is that, is that how kind of you look at it? I mean, I think that's fair. And, you know, there is actually some very interesting data in men showing that infertility is actually an early sign of high risk for other diseases like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and others. So it's very interesting that they can correlate that. So what that tells me is that infertility is probably not like a disease per se, but it is. It's that imbalance, and it's one of the earliest signs that our physiology is off. You know, reproduction is one of the most basic biological things we're meant to accomplish as people, despite it being incredibly complex. But it's also one of the first most sensitive things to be shut off when things are wrong because it's unnecessary. So when you think about um, like that fight or flight response that kicks in when stress is high and cortisol is high, that's intended to save your life. So it diverts blood to your brain and to your muscle tissue, right? But then the opposite of that with what we call rest and digest, that's your parasympathetic kind of relaxed nervous system. And that's where reproduction fits in. So if you are in constant fight or flight mode, your reproductive system, along with other systems, become under-resourced. And that's where we see what I would call sub-fertility. That's a lot of the unexplained infertility that I see. There's not a disease there. There's just two people who are not at optimal health and things aren't coming together because of that. That's not always the case. Sometimes there are like real issues we need to solve, but a lot of the unexplained infertility is the matter of not infertility in a partner, but subfertility of both partners. So that's going back to that 20 to 30% of infertility is actually a combination of both the men and the women not being kind of either compatible or not being of optimal health. It's interesting to me because if I think about it, a woman's monthly menstrual cycle can be seen as a barometer of health. And it's almost like infertility can also be seen as a barometer of health as to whether you're healthy enough to be able to carry a child. Because perhaps if you're not even able to get pregnant, then you're, you're not in a, in a position to also carry this load, which is going to be quite stressful for the next nine months. Right. I mean, it is a protective mechanism to protect the mother, you know, from a like a biological evolutionary standpoint. So going back to the test that you mentioned, so you do a basic analysis of tests. What type of test do you specifically look for initially? It's really routine blood work that you would have done at any lab. Um, We do, usually they have to be timed on certain days of the menstrual cycle. So if you are having an evaluation, a lot of OBs miss this and they'll run hormone testing just on a random day, but that's really not helpful from a fertility perspective. So what you'd want um, initially is on cycle day one is the day you start full flow of your menstrual cycle. So day three, you're probably still on your period. You would have estradiol run, which the estradiol is your primary form of estrogen in your body. It's also called E2. 
Uh, and then you would also run one called FSH or follicle stimulating hormone, which is actually a hormone made by your brain that tells your ovaries what to do. Um, and then you can look at other hormones on that day too, like testosterone, um, DHEA sulfate, which is a precursor to testosterone. Um, I also run anti-mullerian hormone, which AMH is a, another marker for egg quality, not as good, uh, but there's not really a great perfect marker. So we have to run a couple of subpar markers and try to get a glimpse of what's happening. Uh, and then we look on day 21, we look at progesterone levels. So it's actually seven days after you ovulate. That's when your progesterone levels peak. So we want to measure what and see what that peak is. And that tells us if you ovulate, it also tells us a little bit about the health of the cells that produce the egg and that are left over to kind of support a pregnancy. So that would be a baseline hormone evaluation. And then we usually run some of the basic nutritional stuff too, looking at liver function, you know, blood glucose. Um, if you haven't had a like sexually transmitted illness workup, we'll add that on. We do a CBC, which some of that you can, is the basic data. Like, are you anemic, right? Do you have an iron deficiency? So you actually can glean some really interesting data on someone's likelihood of having an environmental toxicity just from a basic CBC and comprehensive metabolic panel, which together cost about $25 to run. So it's really an economical way to get a little bit of an inside scoop on that functional side. And that's an interesting one that not too many people bring up, which is how your environment can actually be that toxic load. So it could be that you're having too much mercury because you're eating too much fish, or you have cadmium, or you have lead, or things like that, which are ultimately then going to be impacting your overall health. Absolutely. And it's heavy metals are a part of it. But the bigger piece I see with fertility is actually um, like pe chlorinated pesticides and phthalates and PCBs, BPA, you know, bisphenols, all those plasticizers. Those are the real issues with fertility because they cause hormonal disruption um, pretty severely, actually. And it's pervasive like BPA. I know we're all using like BPA free plastics now. I think most people are aware of that. But even still, the percentage of people who have it in their bloodstream is like almost 95% at any given time because it's just so pervasive in our environment. And I think also you were saying BPA is bad, but BPC is almost even worse, is it not? Yeah, there are other bisphenols out there that have come out. BPC, you mentioned BPS is another one that are, you can say BPA free because they don't contain bisphenol A, but they contain a sister compound that hasn't been tested, right? Um, and now, I mean, that's what happened initially. Now those have been tested. Many have been shown to be even more potent. So really the best thing to do is to avoid plastics as much as you can when it comes to, you know, food, food storage, both when you're shopping and when you're storing food in your home. And the other place that you get a lot of it is actually receipts in the store. So as much as you can like get an emailed copy or just decline the receipt, the better off you are for not touching that. It's fascinating to me how many of these things you don't think twice about. Somebody gives you a receipt. Yeah, okay, great. How do you think that that's going to be impacting your hormonal balance? That's insane. It's totally insane. And that's the thing when you, when I mentioned it's a drop in the bucket, like if your health was absolutely perfect and that was your only exposure, probably wouldn't be enough to cause an issue. But then you think about like what's in your water supply. You know, if you don't filter your water, you're also getting a lot of stuff in through your water. If you live in a rural area, then you have a high likelihood of having agricultural runoff that seeps in that's then not filtered out. You know, if you're drinking from a well or from public city water from like a reservoir. And then if you're in a city area, that has its own contamination issues too. So it's really interesting. Like, and all these things are teeny, teeny amounts, but you know what else is teeny, teeny amounts in our body? Hormones, <laughs> um, tiny amounts. And so, you know, like parts per million in your bloodstream. So it can have a big impact. So for the water, what, what do you recommend? I mean, so plastics, get rid of plastics, understandably. So eat, including also if you're getting food brought in and you get those little plastic forks, don't eat with the plastic forks probably, right? And the biggest thing is like hot food. Don't heat food in plastic. And actually like, you know, in our family, we have like a true love of Chinese food. We live in a community with a high Chinese, like 30% like Chinese population. So there's some awesome restaurants that have like healthy food. But we don't really do takeout because everything comes back like hot soup in a plastic container, right? Or water bottles is another one, like drinking from water bottles. So yeah, 
we know to avoid the plastics as much as we can. Uh, with water, with drinking water, that's a tricky one because you want to do what you can afford. So the very best is to do reverse osmosis, which is a really good purifying system. But even that doesn't take everything out. But I would just say do what you can. You know, if if all you can afford is a pitcher filter, carbon filter, get that because it takes some things out. But the best thing you can do, every city is required by law to publish a water report at least once a year. So you can call and find out exactly what's in it. And a lot of them will be within the limits of the EPA because if it goes out of that, they'd have to correct it. But you can at least see what's coming up close to that upper limit and look for filtration that would remove that specific contaminant. Things like fluoride even. I was going to say any contaminants that really come to mind that are a complete no-no fluoride or something like that. Yeah, PCBs are a big one. Fluoride, I recommend people not get in their water. You know, if you want to use a fluoride toothpaste that you put in your mouth and spit, that's one thing, but I don't think we should be ingesting it every day. I mean, those are really the, the two big ones. And I'm looking at, it's going to have a lot of different chemical names, but different agricultural runoff issues. Really anything that gets flagged on there. Um, that they're testing for can be a problem. One of our previous conversations, somebody had brought up that most of the water that we have is actually water that's been kind of filtered. So it's water that is coming through the sewer system through, you know, not like toilet water almost that's been filtered over and over again. And so therefore it's been bleached, it's been cleansed and all that. And so if you think about it that way, it's pretty nasty. <laughs> like, that's so disgusting. Yes. <laughs> Like try and clear water that's had poo in it. Yeah, it's going to take a lot of chemicals. So the one yeah, that we it goes did, through a, that big process. Yeah. There's one filter that we've had is called Berkey water filter. Uh, it's this two two barrel one that that apparently is is quite good. The two barrel systems are awesome, and they can go underneath your sink. So that's a really good option. That's kind of an intermediate cost. Reverse osmosis systems are in the thousands of dollars. I don't know what the Berkey costs, but you can get those double chamber systems usually for under a grand, which is a good balance. And it's good for health, period. It's not just about getting pregnant. Having clean water is essential, you know, from a lot of, you know, for a lot of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's one of those things where, okay, you could spend the money on, um, on a Brita filter, but again, look at that versus some of the other ones that are out there. And maybe you'll realize that the Brita for the, for the cost, it might make sense to upgrade to a, to a Berkey or something with a double Agree. And the other thing to think about if you have the means to do it is a whole house system, because um, you actually get a lot of contamination too in the shower um, be, or in the bath. In the bath, you're obviously sitting in it. In the shower, you have the water on your skin, which your skin is very absorbent. Don't un underestimate how much you take in through your skin. Your skin is basically just like, like your digestive tract, right? You absorb things in through it, but it's also aerosolized through steam. So you're inhaling things. And there are certain contaminants like chlorine that um, come through inhalation even more so than they do through drinking, through the digestive system. So there's a lot that can happen, you know. And so if you're going to get just a pitcher filter, I also recommend people buy the screw-on shower filters, um, which are maybe like $15 or $20. And that can help to remove it out of the shower too. So you have a couple options to like get it from your points of water retrieval or to think about a whole house system that just takes care of everything. And then the other component also, and I will we'll get off this topic in a sec, but uh, I think is also given the skin is the makeup that we put on or the, the body lotions or the shampoo or things like that. You mentioned about phthalates before. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So parabens and phthalates in beauty care products are a big issue. And, you know, thankfully, I feel like the last couple of years, the beauty care industry has come a long way to really try to take that stuff out. I mean, I was at the store looking for like a new shampoo and conditioner and even Pantene, which I grew up on now has like no SLS, no parabens, no phthalates. They're aware of it. And that comes from the consumer demand. It's not the companies that are doing it. It's consumers that are asking for it. And so you can even get lower cost products that still have the experience of a typical, you know, shampoo, for example, that they'll suds up still, um, or like a toothpaste, right? You can get good toothpaste now that aren't just baking soda. <laughs> that will work really well for you, give you the like experience you're looking for, but be cleaner. You know, so thank goodness. And makeup too has come like such a long way. There's some really fantastic brands out there that are very ethical. And and one great place to look is um, the Environmental Working Group. 
they publish, they have one called skindeep.org. Uh, and that you can actually look up all of your beauty care products and it will show you a rating system based upon risk of cancer and risk of reproductive harm. So the reproductive harm is the, what you want to pay particular attention to, uh, but they rate it like red, yellow, and green. So it's very, very easy to find clean products and you can look by category too. So if you need a sunscreen or you need a body lotion, you can easily see which ones are the best out there. Yeah, I, I absolutely love EWG. It's, it's a really nice app and they have a whole host of different products. What I noticed as well was that there's a number of products that I think they call it green labeling, where it seems like it's very healthy and it seems like, oh yeah, it's clean living and this, that, and the other. And when you actually look it up on EWG, then you quickly notice that, you know what, it's not quite as clean as that marketing and as that label looks like. Yeah, one brand like that that I used for a really long time, and I'm speaking about it kind of historically, they could be a lot better now. In fact, they probably are. But Aveda was one that I used a lot, like when I was in my 20s. And I thought I was buying something clean and natural because it was herbal. They used some like herbal ingredients and they had marketing that seemed very green. When I first looked at EWG, I was shocked, you know, and I think they've probably improved again due to consumer demand over time but there are so many things out there. So yeah, you have to wipe through the marketing to really get you know, underneath, underneath that. But the nice thing is a lot of retailers now, like Whole Foods Market sets standards that brands have to meet in order to get in. Um, so it does make it easier to shop too, that you can find you know, Thrive Market is another one um, that they put minimum standards in place so that they're not carrying things that are toxic. And so maybe um, talk a little bit more. So I think in terms of the reviews, you know, there's a toxic burden, there's nutrition, there's the impact of birth control. Let's, let's just shift to nutrition and specifically caffeine, alcohol, and sugar, and what impacts that has or may have on infertility. Let's start with alcohol. Alcohol is a known teratogen, right? So when I'm working with clients that are having difficulty conceiving, my recommendation is cut it out. You know, there's just it's something that you don't need, doesn't offer a benefit to you. Caffeine, I would argue, offers a benefit sometimes to you know, help you get through the day. But alcohol is a bonus, right? And if you can cut it out, great. Um, if you do drink alcohol when you're trying to conceive, my recommendation is you drink as little as possible and you spread it out. So what I tell my patients is if, if you are going to have five drinks a week, I'd rather you have one a day than like go all week without and then hit it hard on Saturday night. Because the problem is when your blood alcohol level gets high enough for you to feel a buzz, it's high enough to damage cells, you know? So if you're getting a buzz on, you're having too much when you're trying to conceive. So, but I think if you want to have a beer in the evening or half a glass of wine, you know, I would rather see you space that out and do that periodically versus having too much. But all of the research shows None is best. For a teratogen, can you define that? A teratogen is like a cell damaging compound, it, including eggs and sperm. So it can directly cause damage to cells. So then exactly. So when you say it can cause damage to cells, is it specifically to eggs and sperm or just all cells? All cells, actually. You know, your liver probably gets it the worst, uh, but also does affect egg and sperm. So alcohol, no, no, unless you want to space it out over a couple of days. But again, don't have enough to get a buzz. That's right. And then caffeine? Yeah, you mentioned caffeine. So the data on coffee, you probably see the headlines come up in the news because probably two or three times a year, they say coffee is okay or coffee is not okay for fertility and pregnancy. And really the data shows that if you're drinking two cups of coffee or less per day, you're probably fine. You know, so coffee is typically what's studied. Um, and believe it or not, there are other compounds in coffee that still can cause harm at high amounts. So even decaf coffee in high amounts can still be harmful. So it's not necessarily just caffeine. On the flip side, green tea has very beneficial effects to fertility and green tea contains less, but it still does contain caffeine. So what I generally tell people to do is you know, enjoy, if you love coffee, enjoy like a black tea or a coffee in the morning and then switch to green tea for the rest of the day. I don't worry about people getting too much green tea. There's so many other beneficial polyphenols and flavonoids um, that the benefit outweighs any harm caused by a small amount of caffeine. Sugar is a tricky one. I mean, sugar, again, everything in moderation, but when your blood sugar is out of whack, your fertility can be directly affected. Um, there's hormonal impacts, 
you can be more likely to gain weight, which can then make it tougher to get pregnant. You don't want insulin resistance when you're trying to conceive. That makes it tricky. So really the best thing you can do is eating a whole foods diet. Mediterranean diet has a ton of data around fertility um, and really cutting back on the refined carbohydrates and sugars as much as you can. Mm. So can you dig in a little bit more on that insulin sensitivity and how, what the mechanism is and why it impacts fertility? Yeah, so there's still pieces that we don't know, but when there's insulin sensitivity in place and there's high blood glucose, the ovaries tend to be less responsive. So they end up you know, not hearing the signals from the brain and not responding as well. It could be some kind of cross-reactivity that with ins insulin sensitivity, when there's a lot of sugar around, your cells will pull in insulin receptors so that you don't get flooded. Um, and it's likely that maybe estrogen receptors are also affected or there could be other mechanisms at play. But we do know that it can cause hormonal disruption in men and women, but women seem to be even more affected. The other piece of it is if you're pregnant, and your blood sugar is out of whack, you are also at a higher risk of um, gestational diabetes, of preterm labor, of having a baby with a birth weight that's too low or too high, and your child can have higher risk of illness throughout their life. That's another super interesting topic, and another reason why I love preconception care um, is that the outcome on the child can be huge. It can be really huge. And so that's why when you talk about preconception care, you often do say that it's three, four months, but kind of as a time frame, right? Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So believe it or not, it's about 110 days for a sperm to be made and for an egg to go through its final maturation process. It's about a four month window of time when your body is getting those two cells ready. And remember, like if you're going to build a child, you're counting on like two cells. It's like one egg and one sperm. And that's the blueprint. Like the genetic data in there is the best that child will ever get ever. You know, they can't surpass it. They can't go above it. So, you know, I think parents should feel a lot of responsibility, even if they're not struggling with infertility to take care of themselves and make sure that egg and sperm is as healthy as possible. And there's amazing data on that, that when couples do that, not only does it um, improve their odds of getting pregnant and having a baby, but it actually improves the health outcomes for that child. And some of the things that have been studied, they, they range from childhood obesity to adult diabetes and heart disease to schizophrenia. I mean, to autism, the results are broad. You know, when they look at children who are born to parents who prepare and are in good health versus those that don't, the impact on the children is like really profound. So from my perspective, like as a naturopath, one of our core foundational beliefs is the power of prevention. And when we think about that, usually we're talking about it as like, what can I do to prevent disease in my own later life, right? But preconception care is actually improving the health of the next generation. You know, our generation is seeing the lowest life expectancy on the books. You know, it's for the first time it's going down instead of going up. But I think we have the ability to change that for our children through just good preparation before we get pregnant. I hadn't heard about the schizophrenia. So it's really interesting to think how our generation now, potentially folks who are having schizophrenia or mental health issues or are you know, looking at, at us as adults now, what was it that our parents did during their youth <laughs> that probably affected us? Yeah, and you know, you think about, there are still women out there who, whose moms took a drug called DES during pregnancy, yep. uh, which DES, it was given widely and you get asked about it on health forums and might not know what it is, but they thought it would actually improve the woman's like health of their pregnancy, but it turns out it had negative impacts and caused sterility of their daughters that were born. Um, and in some that it was lower doses, it can cause infertility, but you know, there's a lot of other things that we, our moms were exposed to when we were in utero that are kind of out of our control or our ability to fix. And I actually think a lot of the infertility rates we're seeing now, they're due to what we are exposed to, but probably also what our moms were exposed to and what our grandmothers were exposed to that we're paying the like generational price for um, and kind of climbing an uphill battle. Things are cleaner now than they were in the 70s when companies would just dump waste into rivers we've at least improved through like the 90s, late 90s and 2000s um, that we're not facing that type of exposure today, but I think we're still kind of paying the cost for it.
Mm, that's an interesting point of view as well. Yeah. It, oftentimes now people are saying, oh, well, we wish we had it how it was for our grandparents. The spinach that we're eating today doesn't have as many nutrients as what our previous generations had. So it's, it's often a dialogue of we're in a worse situation now than we were before. Whereas uh, it's, you're kind of saying the flip, which is, which is also true. You know, both, both are true in, in their own right. Yeah, I think both are true. I mean, at the start of the industrialization in the early 1900s, you know, prior to that, we didn't have a lot of these synthetic chemicals in our environment. And then I think things kind of started to go up where it was like the power of science, you know, and the Tupperware generation and Teflon and all these things that now we're starting to say, okay, pull it back a bit because although these seem miraculous to improve our life in some ways, they're detrimental to our health and we're trying to get them out. And we're learning that like PFOA is like from Teflon, we can't get them out of our environment. You know, we're just trying to do the best we can to avoid them. Um, but at least we know now to like not let companies dump industrial waste into our rivers. You know, we are, we're trying. We're to getting get better. Yeah. I think we're, st- we're starting to have the conversation about glyphosate and, and things like yeah. that. We're getting there, but it's still. And you know, the interesting thing is what will be that thing of our generation? Will it be exposure to Wi-Fi and yeah. to cellular signals that years, like our kids will learn you know, that those things were causing harm. And although we thought they were miracles, there are detrimental health effects there too. We don't really know yet, but I imagine that we're going to be getting more information as time goes on. EMFs is an interesting one. I, I myself am, am electro hypersensitive, so I feel it quite, quite a bit. And it's interesting because we are so drawn to and the internet of things. We're so drawn to a 5G or a quick, you know, being able to, to download a movie in five seconds. And, and in truth, it's what are those environmental toxins coming that we can't see that pr- previously it was lead paint that we didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Perhaps EMFs and all of these invisible networks are going to be the new lead in that we'll know about in 20 years, 30 years. It is something that I talk with my fertility patients about. I mean, it's on the radar. And I think there's enough knowledge to know that it can cause harm. And we should at least take the precautionary principle to be smart about how we use technology. What are the things that you use, you know, to limit your exposure? So I, I have a, it's called, it's called a defender shield. So it's a case. Um, and so it's when I test it with my EMF meter, I notice that there's a complete difference. So there's certain products that, you can get um, just a shield, but honestly, most of the time, it's just keep it as far away as possible as for as long as possible. You know, I don't need my phone to be right next to me if I am not expecting a phone call. It can be on the other side of the room and just have it on noise, um, like kind of a, a sound. And so if somebody does call me, then yes, I can go run to it. But I think it's also a habit of, of changing that habit of always needing to be next to your phone. Um, the, the other thing that I do is I put my phone on airplane mode and, um, and then I'll just turn on the Wi-Fi if, if I'm expecting phone calls. And so if people want to call me, then they can just text me and then say, okay, turn on the phone. Right. But how often, I think it's interesting because when I tell my friends about that, they, they say, well, I can't live that way. I get so many phone calls. It's like, when was the last time that you actually got a phone call? Yeah, those are great. I mean, I take, I give people the same suggestions. Like a lot of people use their phones as alarm clocks at night, which I generally say, like get all light out of the bedroom, including your phone, leave it out if you can. Um, But if you do have it next to your bedside, you should put it in airplane mode all night while you're sleeping. But even better than that is um, we encourage people to, you know, those like timers that you can use on your Christmas lights where you can set on and off. I encourage people to put them on their Wi-Fi router. That way their Wi-Fi actually shuts down at like 11 p.m., kicks back on at five or 6 a.m. Whenever you need it, you won't want it to be there, but that way you're not exposed for those hours at night when you're not using it. You know, so it is about, you know, sometimes people are wary or they're, I'm afraid they're going to think I'm totally nuts when I talk about it with them, but you know, you feel it, not everyone feels it, but that's only because of their like sensitivity and perception. It doesn't mean it's not having an impact. So, you know, it's, I usually tell people, I'm not going to tell you not to have a cell phone. Don't worry. But like, don't keep it in your pants pocket next to your scrotum all day long, you know, put it on your desk when you're at work or, you know, put it somewhere else where it's not on your body physically, you know, the further, even six to 12 inches makes a difference compared to having it in a pocket. So, you know, you just do what you can, you buy the defender shield, 
you don't put it on you, you know, you turn it off at night. All those things make a difference. There's a really good book. Um, gosh, the non tinfoil guide to EMFs. I think it's called, it's by Nick Peanault. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. He, um, he's an investigative journalist and actually interesting. He started looking into EMFs when his wife was pregnant with their first child. And he quickly started looking into it and said, wait, something's up here. And so he goes into a, cause he's not, he's, he wasn't aware of, about EMFs. And so the book is, in a, is written in a really easy to read manner where he talks about, he breaks down the different types and the various areas where we don't see it, where we don't think twice about it. For example, right next to your bed, if your lamp is plugged in, there's a lot of dirty electricity coming from there. So just even unplugging it, um, rather than just hitting the, the off switch, literally unplugging it if it's right next to you. Um, to the extent of microwaves and hair dryers and um, those types of things, they actually give off a lot of EMFs that we don't think twice about. And then he did talk about as well, the kind of he goes through the different phases of easy fix, which is put your phone away from you. That's an easy fix. Down to a medium one of getting your Wi-Fi router on a timer. Down to all the way to the to the final, which is you know having a circuit breaker that you turn everything off at night, um, or you know looking into smart meters and making sure that they're not on the other side of your bedroom wall and you're not sleeping really right next to a smart meter. But it's a good book. Um, I, I would recommend it for folks. Birth control and the impacts of birth control potentially on fertility. There are so many women who've taken birth control and then when they stop their cycle just picks right back up and it's fine. Um, and then there are other women who have um, a lot of trouble getting their cycle back in a normal manner after birth control pills. So I think it's probably not the birth control pill directly. That's the problem. It's the birth control pill in combination with other factors happening with the woman. However, you know, birth control pills, they do cause specific nutrient deficiencies like magnesium and B vitamins that can become chronic when you're on them for a long time. So sometimes that needs to be repaired and they cause, I mean, they override your hormonal systems. They basically shut it down. They shut down ovulation. So depending upon the sensitivity of the communication between your brain and your ovaries, they can be problematic. And I work with a lot of women who need help to get jump started again with a normal cycle, even young women after being on birth control pills for three months, six months, 10 years. The birth control p pill kind of messes up the communication or the balance between the various hormones, between pregnenolone, between progesterone. And then also, I think I, there, there's a link there with cholesterol. Can you talk about that link between the three? Yeah. So, I mean, birth control pills always have at least some progesterone, like, you know, they call it progestogens. They kind of trick your body into thinking you're already pregnant and that suppresses ovulation. Okay. So that's the basics. Some birth control pills contain estrogen and progesterone both, or the reason why they're numbered is they might have a biphasic or a triphasic where they have different combinations of those hormones throughout the course of the month to try to kind of mimic your cycle, but also prevent a pregnancy. Um, and that's why different pills are utilized for women with acne versus not, or why, you know, if you gain weight on one, you might be switched to a different brand um, because they're all a little bit different. But yes, you know, cholesterol is the backbone for all of our hormone biosynthesis, estrogen, testosterone, um, progesterone, they all come from this cholesterol backbone. So when you're taking hormones exogenously, what happens is your body senses they're not around and it will change the signaling around your own innate production of hormones. This is the same with thyroid medication, right? If you take thyroid medication externally when you don't need it, you'll be high for a little while, but then your brain will be like, wait a minute, we have enough around. I don't need to tell the thyroid to keep making it. And if you took a, a, a pill long enough, your body would not be able to make it anymore afterward because it would shut down that signaling. So similarly with women's hormones, you know, it really changes that communication pattern. And like you said, with the cholesterol levels, you have a different need for cholesterol because you have these pools of cholesterol that we get through our diet and through liver metabolism, but it's not being pulled into hormone synthesis anymore at the same rate that it was before, you know, because you just don't need it quite so much. 
So then in terms of cleansing yourself or kind of getting yourself back up to normal, the things that you, it's not a one size fits all. I can understand that, but oftentimes it's the magnesium and B12 that you find are the deficiencies or is there anything else? Yeah. So I think to begin, I like using magnesium in a B complex um, with a lot of B6, which is one that becomes particularly deficient on B vitamins. And then the other thing would be supporting liver function. So the liver is responsible to metabolize most things that we get exposed to and also our hormones too. So some of the things I love using are um, ground flaxseed. I like milk thistle a lot. Um, dandelion root is another really nice one. So I like using liver supportive herbs as well. Burdock is another one that you can do easy in a tea. Um, that They're gentle, but they really are effective to kind of get the liver stimulated to really make sure that you're metabolizing things. And I actually use similar liver support like that in women who don't tolerate IVF drugs very well. So they might go through a round of IVF where they're on massive amounts of drugs to stimulate their ovaries to produce follicles that'll be retrieved. Um, And then after that cycle is over, we'll do a couple months of like really cleansing. Um, N-acetylcysteine is another one. It's a nutrient, not an herb, but that's another one that's awesome for liver function. And it's also awesome for fertility. So that's another one that I'll use for women who are wanting to conceive and getting off birth control because it's a great antioxidant and it's also really helpful for the liver. You and your clients, you typically see minimum it's three, four months, right? So versus IVF, it sounds to me much more of a scientific experiment, frankly, but it also is potentially you're you're pregnant within a, a shorter amount of time, a couple of weeks versus the route that you do with your clients that seems to be longer, but but more of the natural route rather than scientific experiment. Is that a good summary? I think that's a good summary. And I am not anti-IVF. Like one, I'm so grateful because we have so much data on fertility and pregnancy because gobs of men and women have gone through it and have been willing to allow their information to be shared so we can learn. So from a science perspective, so, so grateful because they've pulled apart this mystery of the steps to get pregnant. And we have so much more information to be able to help people with. Secondly, the timeline thing can be really important for an older couple, three to four months could dramatically change their fertility. If a woman's 39 or 42 or 43, and she didn't have access to IVF, you know, in four months time, her cycles could stop, right? So for some people, that short time frame is really helpful and really important. And that's okay. You know, I work with so many great reproductive endocrinologists and it would always be my preference to work with patients with just naturopathic medicine. But in the world we live in, partnership is essential. And like so many couples benefit from naturopathic medicine plus conventional medicine. So I'm really open to the use of it. And ultimately, like this is my belief for healthcare for women, period, is we should have whatever feels right to us from a reproductive health perspective. You should be able to know your options and you should be able to choose. And I'm so grateful that in the world of fertility, women get access to so many different options that they can choose from. You mentioned about the kind of IVF and, um, and other options as well. Can we just touch on that of kind of the conventional side of, of treatment for fertility or infertility and the more naturopathic way? What how do you see as the difference? And yeah, just how do you see that as a difference? So my very favorite patients to work with are the ones who come in proactively and say, we think we want to get pregnant later on this year. Can you help us get as healthy as possible so that we don't have any problems and I get my cycle straight and we can work to get pregnant? That's like 1% of my patient population, but they are my favorite. <laughs> the ones who are thinking ahead. But usually couples have gone through some conventional process to try to conceive before they see me. So if you try for six months or 12 months, depending on your age, and you don't conceive, then you warrant a workup medically, um, depending upon your age. If you're under 35, they say wait a year. If you're over 35, after six months, you should have a, be evaluated. Usually people start with their OBGYN, um, and they'll do the lab workup. And if they find any issue. And sometimes if they don't, if it's unexplained, they'll typically start with one of two drugs, Clomid or Letrozole. These are both oral pills that you take. Um, And they basically 
will get your brain to overstimulate your ovaries. Now talk a little bit about there's IVF and there's egg freezing. Can you talk about the difference? Because I think a lot of people think that they're the same. Well, so egg freezing is like the first, it would be like going through step one of IVF only. So with IVF, first they retrieve your eggs. You know, you get stimulated and they retrieve your eggs. Typically, if you have a partner, you would go through the process of fertilizing those eggs. And then if you want to freeze, you'd freeze the embryos, which are the male and female partner together, you know, in an early embryo. If you're single and you want to freeze your eggs to think about preserving your fertility, it gets done obviously before fertilization because you don't have a partner that you're working with then. And that can still work. And, and believe it or not, with older women, the biggest fertility issue is egg quality. If a woman's cycling and the embryo is a good quality, implantation doesn't seem to be as negatively affected by age as egg quality. So freezing eggs can be a good option for women who are young and they know they want to have a career and they know they want to delay having children until their late 30s. It's a great insurance policy. I mean, it's expensive, but at least you know that you have the best eggs you can produce before you have age-related decline in quality playing a factor. Right. The one caveat probably with that, there's a really great Scientific American article that came out, I think last year, um, where basically they were, they were touting how incredible IVF is and how um, egg freezing is really on the boom, which is exactly what you said. The fact that we have this kind of science available to us and these options is, in, is, is something that we never could have done 10, 20 years ago that our mothers couldn't have done, right? So it's, it really is a push in the forefront of medicine. That being said, what that article did mention was at the end of the day, it's the option of having a baby. It is not necessarily guaranteeing that anything will, will actually take place because exactly what you've been saying, there are so many pieces to the chain of events that have to do, happen just right, just all those dominoes lined up getting a good egg is one component to it. So it's the option of having good eggs in 10 years or whenever you you wish to be pregnant, but it's not a guarantee. And I think that that, from a psychological perspective, just keeping that in mind was especially because it's, it's very easy, I think, when you're in your 20s to say, okay, I know that I don't want to have children until I'm 35, you know, 38. And assuming that you can completely 100% bank on that that's probably not exactly true. That's a great point. And, you know, we're also really early in the process of promoting, you know, egg freezing. So my guess is that probably most eggs are still frozen for women who chose to do that. You know, we're probably just getting into those women becoming of age where they want to start to have children, where we'll start to get more data on the impact of freezing. Do they fertilize as well? What are fertility rates in these women? Um, So you're exactly right. It's only one piece of the fertility puzzle. It's a really important piece for older women, egg quality, but it still is only one piece. Just similar to how we've just now been starting to realize how a C-section potentially impacts a child's immune system. And, you know, this is only 15, 20 years down the line when these children are now older question for you about genetics and how that plays into infertility are there any both from a is is there any black and white obviousness which I assume no Uh, but then also are there certain SNPs that you then start saying okay let's have these additional supplements because you aren't you're a poor methylator or things like that yeah so there are genetic disorders that result in sterility, like one that comes to mind is Turner syndrome, um, which you can know about at birth, a condition that affects girls at birth, um, and sterility is an outcome of that. Um, but those are relatively rare, but there are a lot of SNPs. We're at the early end of understanding the genetics, uh, but I would say the other piece of genetics is women who are born with sterility, but also um, who have high risk of genetic illnesses that are not compatible with life, like, which if you worry about that, you can get genetic testing done with your partner. And they actually look at both partners in combination to see what the risk is. And I've actually had some patients who have such high risk of specific illnesses, like cystic fibrosis, that they choose to get an egg donor to overcome that because the risk of non-survivable genetic 
issues or of survivable but really difficult genetic diseases is high. Um, and then the other piece is the SNPs that can impact fertility. There are some like MTHFR mutation is one um, that can have an impact on fertility. The data used to say actually that it didn't impact miscarriage rates, um, that it was non-significant findings, but we've seen it, you know, and I think it's easy to correct. And in fact, nowadays I don't test for it as much because like almost all the folate in the marketplace is methylfolate that we're utilizing. Um, but sometimes like if someone also has a COMT mutation, that means they need different B vitamin support in addition to the methylfolate. So I do look at those genetics as one of the additional functional tests through looking at um, like 23andMe or Ancestry.com is actually a little bit more comprehensive with the SNPs they look at. And then we can run it through a couple of different um, like data processing software that can help us el elucidate what SNPs we should be considering. Um, there are some SNPs, I don't know the name and the code off the top of my head, but ones that make it more difficult for you to process BPA um, or that mean that you really require a certain type of vitamin E in order to be effective or that we need to watch your vitamin A levels or that you, maybe you need a higher vitamin A level than standard. So there's a lot that have indication as to like nutrient, it points in the direction of like honing in nutrition based upon genetic SNPs. So it's helpful, but it's not, we're not at the stance now yet with genetic testing that it's, it's a complete game shifter for you on the infertility standpoint. Yeah, agree. Yeah, I think that's fair. But we do look at it. I think it, um, it can be helpful in women where we don't know what's going on um, to be able to take a look at that. I'm the kind of person that I like data. That's the scientist in me. And I think if you have the resources to access it and someone says, well, my doctor wants me to do this test. What do you think? You know, my thought process is the more information you have to make the right decision for you, the better off it is. And so if you have the genetic data, we definitely want to look at it. One thing that I think I had heard in a previous talk of yours was progesterone suppositories. Can you talk a little bit about that? So progesterone suppositories, I do use in early pregnancy um, for women where their progesterone level is low. Progesterone kind of rises through the first trimester and it can be low progesterone can be a cause of early miscarriage. Although the data says it's only about 5% of miscarriages. So, and I think most people assume it's a much higher cause of miscarriage than it really is. Um, but progesterone is really essential in order to have good fertility and to retain a pregnancy. So um, some people use progesterone suppositories in couples who are trying to conceive in the second half of their cycle if their progesterone is low. And we can do that, but it's not my favorite thing to do because, again, it's a root cause thing. I like to say, well, why is the progesterone low? Because you should be producing enough. Progesterone, if we think back to the cycle, you know, the first half of your cycle, you're working on producing estradiol. After they walk off the stage, the cells that are left behind that were making estrogen, they get transformed into a different kind of cell called the corpus luteum. That's probably familiar to a lot of people who are listening um, and certainly to you. And the corpus luteum is responsible to make progesterone. And it's like a ticking time bomb. It makes it for 14 days in a healthy scenario. And then the corpus luteum shrivels up and stops making progesterone. Your progesterone level declines and your period will begin. Now, for some women, if progesterone is too low, the second half of their cycle might be too short. So the time between ovulation and the time they start their period might be 10 days or 11 days, or it might be 14 days, but their progesterone level is low. And low would be like optimal is above 15. Okay, above 12 is adequate. Um, if you're getting 10 and below, that's getting worrisome to me, that it's not enough to sustain a pregnancy. But I think back to, well, why, where does the progesterone come from and why are those cells not doing their job, right? And there's a lot of information that shows that oxidative stress and free radical damage impact the health of those cells, the, of the corpus luteum, and they make progesterone lower. And if you treat with antioxidants, you can actually raise progesterone levels. Okay, so that's one thing is, and, and actually I see that clinically that the women who tend to have low progesterone tend to also be the women who don't like fruits and vegetables. I just see that pattern over and over again. Um, 
And so, or they smoke or something like that. And they have a higher level of oxidative stress in their life, or they're under a ton of stress, right? They're, and, and of course, you talk about like how, you know, making cortisol requires pregnenolone and pregnenolone is also the precursor to progesterone. So some people call it the um, cortisol, pregnenolone steel, right? Whether or not that exists, I don't know that we have the data for, but another issue is high chronic stress means high oxidative stress that also lowers progesterone levels through damaging the corpus luteum cells. So if we can identify why you're not producing enough progesterone, I would always much rather get it up through improving health. Um, the other thing that can happen is if estrogen's not getting high enough in the first half of the cycle, then the surge of LH, which is luteinizing hormone, that's the hormone that triggers ovulation. But it, luteinizing hormone is also the hormone that transforms what are called granulosa cells, which make the estrogen, transforms them into a corpus luteum. If LH isn't high enough, those cells don't get transformed adequately and they're not going to do their job as well. So really the first things I look at with low progesterone is, well, what does their estrogen look like in the first half of their cycle and what's their antioxidant status? If we see problems there, I like to try to fix those before jumping to progesterone, which I think is kind of a Band-Aid fix. And it can work. It's a, if a woman really wants it, I'm not totally opposed, but it's not really fixing the problem. I've had uh, folks tell me, well, why don't I just get a progesterone cream? And it's exactly that point of, yeah, you probably could, but again, hormones are one of those things where it can throw things out of whack as well. And it's, and it does need to be dosed correctly and in the right time. So the amount, right amount and the right time of the cycle as well. Yep. And you also have to rotate where you're applying it and you can deal with like local tissue saturation issues where a dose that worked for you before won't work anymore. Um, so you do have to be careful with it. Uh, the progesterone cream is a solution sometimes for people too. Uh, but again, not my go-to. I think ND is way overprescribed progesterone. I like the, the comment about antioxidants and how that really impacts. And it goes back to your, your lifestyle and your diet. And while that's, it seems like it's just so easy and thinking that food is medicine or thinking that food is really going to be the, the potential answer, but it just takes longer. And it's, but it is, it is the signaling that you have every single day, twice, three times a day, whenever you're eating of building that, the, the blocks of your body, because that is what you do when you eat. Yeah, literally every cell in your body is made of something that you put in your mouth, right? So you have to think about it. And when it comes to fertility, it's particularly interesting because male fertility, believe it or not, is heavily dictated by nutrition between the ages of 10 and 12 in boys. Really? And that can impact their health, their fertility later on in life, which like, that is not the age group you want to trust with good nutrition choices. <laughs> So, um, you know, if you're a parent, you know, make sure those kids eat well if you want to have like lots of healthy, easy grandchildren. <laughs> Grandkids. So no pop tarts at between ages of 10 and 12. <laughs> Seriously, I have a son who's, he'll be 12 this year and it's like, you know, the toughest age because he has the independent thinking that he has his own thoughts about what he wants. He doesn't just eat what I put in front of him anymore. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, it's tricky age. What, what is that link out of curiosity? How is it from 10 to 12? Is it just that's the time of puberty or what, what is it's it? It's the time of, yeah, it's called the slow growth period. And it's the period that directly precedes puberty and really when puberty is beginning. Uh, and it's the time where the testicles go into maturation mode. So if you are a doctor and you watch kids develop, their tanner stages start to change there, like the testicles start to grow. So like a boy who's nine, his penis is very small, his testicles are very small versus 12 or 13 when it, everything starts to grow. It's when the hormonal system starts to prime. So um, the cell health as the testicles grow is dictated by nutrition during that period of time. There's some interesting studies on it um, and, and how it can carry epigenetic imprinting is really the mechanism they know about, um, which is just about its methyl groups and, and other structure changes to DNA that really tell that DNA, like how it should be read. Um, and so it, that's when that stuff gets imprinted in boys. How interesting. So going in terms of the food that we should be eating, uh, you know, there's, there's broccoli with the, with the, which is full of sulfurophane, which is, is said to be quite, 
quite good for fertility. Do you agree with that? And are there other foods that are really prime that we should be should we we should be eating, especially for the kind of four or five months of of preconception care? The Mediterranean diet has the most data around fertility, both when they look at studies of like populations that naturally eat a Mediterranean diet compared to a Western diet, fertility rates are much higher. But also in people with infertility, when they are prescribed a Mediterranean diet, fertility rates improve. So it's really promising that it can actually be therapeutic. So what that looks like, and I actually modify it in my practice, but Mediterranean diet is a plant-based diet. So meats and sweets are at the top of the pyramid, you know, not a lot of red meat, not a lot of sugar, um, but not a lot of dairy. It's plants, fish, um, olives and olive oil are actually their own food group in the Mediterranean diet. Uh, And I think a lot of those things ring true for what I see be really beneficial. So eating the rainbow of fruits and vegetables, high fiber. I tell my patients, I want your fiber comically high. That's what I tell them. I want it to be that you're eating so much fiber that it's funny, you know, like 35 to 45 grams a day um, through your diet if possible, not through a supplement. And what's an example in terms of fiber? Sorry to interrupt you there. Um, for fiber, what is something that, like, give us an example of how much is 35 grams? So um, I generally eat between like 45 and 50 grams a day. And like my breakfast is two to three cups of veggies with like a couple eggs scrambled in. So like I get a ton of vegetables at breakfast. I usually have one to two servings of fruit per day, a salad with dinner or like sweet potato or something like that. Um, But some of the best sources of fiber for people who are trying to conceive, avocados, believe it or not, are like rock stars when it comes to fiber and to good quality fats. So like doing a half an avocado a day is awesome when you're trying to conceive. Um, Nuts, fruits, and vegetables. Um, It's someone, if you see someone who's like consciously eating a lot of fruits and veggies and plant foods, they would hit that. But this average American you know, who maybe gets one or two servings a day, they might be at like 15 grams, maybe 20 grams a day of fiber if you're not consciously working at it. The omega-3 fats and healthy fats are the other thing. And I think I kind of diverge from the Mediterranean diet here because the Mediterranean diet is traditionally low fat, but I think fats are a little bit more important when you're trying to conceive specifically, but it's the right kind of fat. So no trans fats, which is a lot easier now excuse me, it's taken out of a lot of foods and you don't get it out at restaurants, but really good quality fats are important. So I pretty much take people off of conventionally raised animal products and say, you've got to go local. You want grass fed beef where the fat, it's more CLA, it's healthier fats. You know, you want grass fed butter, you want plant-based fats like nuts and seeds and avocado and, and olive oil is awesome staying away from your like refined conventional oils, like vegetable oil, soybean oil, saf, you know, safflower oil, all those oils, um, and sticking with more wholesome oils and fats. But I, I accommodate a bit more of that. Like I, you know, Mediterranean diet might say red meat once a week. I think if you're doing grass fed, you could probably do it three times a week, you know, but you should be doing more fish, you know, wild caught fish, clean fish, um, to make sure that your healthy fats are up. That's really critical for good fertility. And in terms of then teas, supplements, tinctures, those types of things that that women can start taking. I mean, holy basil, for example, I drink a holy basil tea quite often. I just like the taste of it. What other types of things like that? So, you know, teas and herbs are like secret sauce, you know, and I love getting my patients on those when they're trying to conceive. You know, first let's talk about culinary herbs. So like all of the culinary herbs, like rosemary, garlic, ginger, turmeric, basil, what are your other favorites? Marjoram, you know, sage. all of those, like they have the aromatic quality. All of those come from polyphenols and flavonoids. So those are all therapeutic. So I tell my patients heavily spice your food. That's another way that you can get a wide range of antioxidants just through your diet. So don't underspice, like overspice. I put spices on my salad now in lieu of dressing sometimes, right? Don't be afraid to use them liberally. And the same goes with what you drink. That's another awesome way to like sneak in more therapeutics and more antioxidants. So I love holy basil. It's like, it tastes really good. Um, it's really, it has like a sweet quality to it. And 
it blends great with other things. There's a Tulsi line that I love that like in our house, we make Tulsi hibiscus tea and we drink that instead of juice. Like even my kids love it. It's really palatable. Um, green tea is also awesome to drink through the day. Um, you can do like matcha, you know, or whatever kind of green tea you like. They make all kinds of flavors of green tea. And then from a fertility perspective, I also love nettles because it's very mineral rich and nutrient rich. And red clover also is a phytoestrogen. So that can help raise estrogen levels. So if you don't have problems with estrogen dominance, then drinking red, um, drinking red clover, sorry, is really, really beneficial. And that's the flowering tops. You could pick it yourself if you have clover in your lawn and it's organic. It's just the flowers that you would brew into a tea. Those are probably my favorite general recommendations. I use a ton of tinctures in my practice. Um, if women are irregular, normally I'll want to do labs and work them up. But once they have their blood drawn, I might start them on Vitex, which is like one of my very favorite powerhouse herbs. And I would say like 50% of the time, women are mostly better just with Vitex. Is it a, a cup a day or what? how do you take it? So I recommend it as a tincture, which is alcohol-based. So it tastes kind of gross. Um, but you take it first thing in the morning, like one teaspoon in the morning when you wake up, um, right before you brush your teeth, maybe, because it does not taste good. You can mix it into a little water or juice if you need it to get it down. Um, but you want to do it right when you wake up. Uh, and that's the way that we typically give it. You take it throughout your whole cycle. And it actually works to improve the communication along your hypothalamus, pituitary, and ovarian axis. So that communication stream that controls your reproductive system it really helps to improve that communication. They used to think it was a progesterogenic herb because they saw progesterone go up when women took it, but it's actually, it has no progesterone-like activity. It really is just working to improve your body's own signaling pathways, which is awesome. And it's a natural herb, right? It's not Vitex, yeah, sounds like a drug, herb. but it's a natural herb, right? Yeah, it's chase tree berry is what it's called. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, the alcohol does not taste like blueberries or anything delicious, but it does work really, really well. And then also, how about um, licorice or ashwagandha or, um, what's the other one I was thinking of? Shivandra, is it? Chisandra? Just, no, sh sh there's another one. I can't remember. Chadavari, maybe? Chadavari, yeah. I love adrenal restorative herbs for women. Like, we tend to be go, go, go all the time. So, uh, and a lot of these herbs have a strong tradition of historic use in women for longevity throughout their lifespan. Um, Shadavari is one of my very favorites. It comes from the Ayurvedic Indian tradition. And it was, it's called for the woman with 1000 husbands. That's how it translates. So you can probably imagine all the things this herb is really good for, um, like cervical mucus and libido and um, energy levels to keep up with all those thousands of men. Um, but it also, it helps with hormone function and hormone balancing. So that's another nice one. I like that as a, it's a root powder. Um, I like it as a powder. So any recipe that you've looked up online for like a maca ball, you could sub out shatavari and do the same thing. Just sub out shatavari powder for maca. Maca can be helpful for some women, but it's also very hot and very stimulating. So not everyone responds well to it. So I would say only do that with a practitioner. But shatavari is a great tonic and pretty much safe for anyone. Um, some of the others you mentioned, licorice, I don't use in women trying to conceive unless they absolutely need it. There are some cases like with PCOS where it can be really helpful, um, but that's not one that I would give routinely. I would say Tulsi ashwagandha is also great. That has a lot of fertility data in men and it can improve sperm health in men but it's also a great herb for women. And all of those are like for the woman who's kind of stressed and wired versus like stressed and exhausted. And then the other two that I love are maitake mushroom and reishi mushroom, um, which those have also been studied and shown to improve ovulation rates in women who aren't ovulating. Um, but they're also great adrenal adaptogens. We don't think of them that way. We think of them as immune herbs or we think of mushrooms as immune, but they're hormone balancers and adrenal tonics. And, and they're very, very safe. They taste delicious. You can make a tea, you can eat them. Um, and they're another really, really nice option. Yeah. I take a mushroom complex by um, Fantastic Fungi, I think it is. Um, and it's just a combination of all of them. There's cordyceps, reishi, lion's mane, a whole host of them, because it is, it's an immune booster. It's a, it's adaptogenic. I mean, there's so many different elements from mushrooms that 
I'm not going to have tea all the time, but I do have just a tincture and I just put it in a, a, a squirt of water kind of right before I, I, I wake up or right when I wake up. Yeah, that's awesome. I yeah. love mushrooms. Yeah, I think the last question just for now is um, right now we're seeing, you know, we ha- we're in this time of COVID. We're seeing, and there was just a, an article that came out yesterday, actually. They did a study with 2,200 patients and they looked at women who were trying to get pregnant. And ultimately what it was, was that they said women prior to COVID said that the top three causes for stress for them were infertility, uh, their job, and then financial stresses. Whereas now with COVID, despite the fact that COVID is such a um, a predominant point of conversation and of stress, it still was that the top three was infertility, followed by COVID, followed by their job. So therefore, while COVID is a big stressor right now, infertility and the fact that somebody cannot get pregnant is still number one in in women's minds. So I guess the question to you is, what would you recommend now for women who are trying to get pregnant now, um, given this time of stress? What would you recommend that's different or the same from, from six months ago? I mean, one thing that happened with COVID is actually most fertility clinics shut down, um, at least for a period of time. And so for couples who were like scheduling a cycle or were mid cycle, you can think about how much emotional buildup happens before you go through that process. And then to have that put on hold, it's so disruptive and it's incredibly difficult. I had a lot of new patients come in to see me during that time where they were doing exactly what I hope people would do, which is I have this period that I have to wait. Let me at least make the best of it and do the lifestyle work in the meantime. You know, and I I think that it's helped them do something productive with that time and space that they have to hold, you know, and they have no choice. So I think with patients that are going through this, you know, social distancing and all the added stress that's happening right now, we have to be extra diligent about taking good care of ourselves. One thing I've seen, I don't know if people have reported into you, but I see it in my practice is a lot of women have had cycle irregularity in the last three or four months. And that's because this added stress and changes in lifestyle have really caused our hormones to change. So we, I think being aware of that, making sure that you're sleeping, you know, that you're eating regularly, that you're still exercising, you're taking that time to de-stress and decompress. And a lot of people are under a lot of additional stress if they, you know, work in healthcare or their partner does, or they're, you know, essential workers, or maybe they've had budget cuts in their household due to a job loss, you know, really just doing what you can to simplify and streamline. And, you know, for most people know that it's okay to have a little bit of breathing room um, and allow a little bit of space until that time feels right to get started again. So I, just to close off here, I always ask folks uh, kind of three rapid fire questions so we can go through those maybe. So first one, what would you tell your 15 year old self? I would say, follow your heart, even when it's difficult. And I know that's like such cheesy advice, but I do feel like even at that age, we kind of innately know what's right for us. And if we could, if I could have attuned to that listening earlier on in life and listen to those red flags that came up that I pushed aside, you know, I could have, you know, may have built a different life earlier on. If you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about women's health, what would it be? It would be access, equal access for everyone. So we don't have issues with economic and racial disparity. You know, there are things that happen in women's health, like the higher incidence of maternal and infant mortality dependent on race in America. And there's just absolutely no reason for that. So if I could wave a magic wand, it would be access to fair resources in healthcare. Absolutely. And then lastly, what is one teacher or book that has changed your way of thinking? I think one, and this is an older book, like more than 10 years old, but it was one that I'll always remember reading. It was transformative for me and it's called Having Faith by Sandra Steingraber. So she's an environmental biologist and she wrote the book while she was pregnant. And one, her writing is like poetry. I mean, she blends science and poetry and it's just a beautiful book to read. She also, while she was pregnant with her first pregnancy, was fighting for cleaner air, cleaner water, cleaner environment, and really studying the effect that that has on pregnancy, not fertility per se, but pregnancy. And that is what really opened my eyes to 
the impact that our environment has on us. And it turned me in from being like a patient and a doctor into really being an, an activist uh, because I just feel like that external advocacy, if we really want to achieve optimal health, we all need to be involved in that and, and do our part. 100%. Okay. That's, I have to put that on the reading list then. Cause that sounds, it's an incredible. oldie, but a goodie. Yeah. yeah. She's written another one since, and there's actually a documentary made um, cause she got cancer. And so she started studying the impact of the environment on cancer. And um, that was really well done too, but this was her first book. Okay. I'm de I'll definitely put it in the show notes and then also uh, put on my Amazon list as well. Um, Cause yeah, I think, I think uh, in the environment, the more that we that we realize that it's not, I mean, it is the food that we put in, but I think it's critical to think about the environment, think about the water, the EMFs, the, the things we put on our skin, like all, even the thoughts that we have. And, and I think that there's such a, a tremendous amount of that, of our own emotional stability and the people that are around us and how that impacts our health as well. That right now we're, we're getting there and we're starting to realize that um, through a number of different folks work, but it's, yeah, it's not just about calories in and calories out. <laughs> in, in You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you, that's a, a good note to end on. The mindset's everything. Well, thank you again. Where can people find you? Where um, can they, yeah, can they listen to, to the amazing work that you're doing? So our website is perfectfertility.com and there's a lot of free resources there and online classes and things like that. And that's where you'll find me. Super. And thank you to, I think it was Dr. Carrie Jones who introduced us. This has been wonderful. And I can't wait to, uh, to have you answer some of our questions next week during our Q&A. All right. Well, can't wait. See you then.